This chapter focuses on the central nervous system, which is comprised of the brain and spinal cord. Um, and then the next chapter will be chapter 13 over the peripheral nervous system. So these are the various structures that um, the brain and the uh, spinal cord are developed from. And if you look here at the beginning, it starts off with just the neural tube, which is formed very early in embryonic development um, as one of those part of one of those layers that we talked about, the three germ layers, and um, comes from the ectoderm. <clears throat> and then it divides up into lobes that start to become a little more defined, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon, and then um, secondary brain vesicles give rise to the mature brain structures. Here's the telencephalon that gives rise to the cerebrum, the cerebral hemispheres, the cortex, the white matter, and the basal nuclei, which we'll discuss here shortly, diencephalon, which has, which is composed of the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus in the retina of the eye. Mesencephalon, part of the brain stem that's called the midbrain. Metencephalon um, is the brain stem, the pons, and also the cerebellum. And then you get to the myencephalon, which is uh, part of the brain stem called the medulla oblongata. And then inferior to that is, is the spinal cord. These uh, structures over here that are colored blue, these are the regions where cerebral spinal fluid circulates. So in the cerebrum, you have the lateral ventricles. Ventricles are open areas where the cerebral spinal fluid will circulate. The third ventricle is inside the diencephalon. Um, and then you have the cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, uh, which is in this region. Um, between the brain stem, between the cerebellum and the pons. And then you have the central canal, which flows through the middle of the spinal cord. So this is just an overview. I will not ask you any of these developing structures or anything like that. We're going to focus on these two columns over here as we're going through this chapter. So one thing you want to pay attention to <clears throat> is the difference between gray matter versus white matter. Now, gray matter appears gray because it doesn't have any myelin. Wherever you have myelin, that appears white. So myelinated axons um, are white. Gray matter is everything else. So the neuron cell bodies, remember we called them soma. The dendrites and unmyelinated axons, those are the gray matter. Now, you find the gray matter on the outside of the brain. That area is called the cerebral cortex. On the inside, it's white. So inside the cerebrum is white matter, outside's gray. And when you look at the spinal cord, it's reversed. The white matter is on the outside and the gray is on the inside. The ventricles are the open areas where cerebral spinal fluid circulates. And remember, they're lined by those neural glial cells that are called ependymal cells. And the ependymal cells has the cilia. And so the cilia keeps the cerebral spinal fluid flowing in one direction. So these ventricles are connected to one another and to the central canal of the spinal cord. So you start off with the lateral ventricles. And the, and the lateral ventricles, remember, in the, cere in the cerebrum. Then they drain into the third ventricle, which is inside the diencephalon, by way of these interventricular foramen, little openings in the lateral ventricles that enables, enables the fluid to flow into the third ventricle. Then from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, there's a little canal called the cerebral aqueduct, and that connects these two together. So let's look at a picture, because this is one of your possible essay questions is to describe the formation of root of circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, we're not going to talk about where it's produced until later on, but I'll tell you now where it's produced. These areas are called choroid plexuses. So the choroid plexuses are found primarily in the lateral ventricles and in the third ventricle. And they produce the cerebral spinal fluid as well as the ependymal cells. And it goes into the lateral ventricles, 
and then into the third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, central canal, and then eventually in the subarachnoid space of the meninges, okay? So that's pretty much the circulation plan. And then you're replacing cerebral spinal fluid three times a day. So the cerebral spinal fluid ends up being reabsorbed into structures called arachnoid villi. Okay, so this is a lateral view. That's the front view. So you want to remember lateral ventricles, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, central canal, produced by the choroid plexuses, reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi. Okay, and I said we will address that more a little bit later, but I wanted to put it all in one spot for now. Okay, so the cerebrum is the superior part of the brain, makes up 83% of its mass, and is divided into two hemispheres. And the cerebrum has this bumpy appearance because it has these elevations and depressions. And the elevations are the ridges are called gyri, gyrus is singular, gyri is plural, and the shallow grooves or the depressions are called sulci, sulcus is singular. Now, if you have major separations between the tissue, it's complete separations, these are very deep, deep grooves, these are called fissures. And important fissures to remember, the longitudinal fissure separates the two hemispheres Okay, it separates the right and left cerebral hemisphere, and the transverse cerebral fissure separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. So those are two important fissures to remember. Now, there are some important sulci to remember too. Now, the central sulcus separates the precentral gyrus. This is an elevation, okay? So the precentral gyrus is in the frontal lobe Postcentral gyrus is in the parietal lobe, and this is the sulcus that separates them. So actually, the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And that's going to be very important later on because the frontal lobe is involved with motor output. A lot of your motor areas are there. And the parietal lobe is involved with sensory input. So if you're making little notes as you go, this is going to really tie in together as we move along. The parietal occipital sul sulcus separates the occipital and parietal lobes. Not as important. This is a major one, okay? And then your lateral sulcus outlines the temporal lobes of the brain. And something else that's really important is because there's a fissure, the longitudinal fissure separates the two cerebral hemispheres. This is the connection underneath. So your right brain knows what your left brain is doing because you have this um, white matter called the corpus callosum that connects the cerebral hemispheres inferiorly. So when you think about the cerebrum, the cerebrum is very complex. In chapter 11, we talked about these neuronal pools and the connections made between neurons that are very, very complex and vary from person to person. It all is um, according to your experiences, your heredity. Uh, many things go into how our brains are um, put together and what kind of wiring we have in between neurons as a whole. And so you want to make sure that you, when you think about the cerebrum, think about these four generalizations of the cerebral cortex. First of all, there's three types of functional areas, okay? We have sensory, we have motor, and we have association. Each hemisphere is concerned with a contralateral side of the body. That means that the right hemisphere controls the left side, the left side controls, uh, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. That's contralateral. There is some lateralization of cortical function within the hemispheres. There are certain things that are dominant in the right hemisphere, dominant in the left hemisphere, okay? Like language, science, math, left hemisphere, those, that's where those things are dominant. And then the right hemisphere, art, music, uh, creativity, um, all those things are stored in the right hemisphere. So that's what I mean by lateralization of functioning. But conscious behavior, how you experience what's going on around you, involves the entire cortex in some way. So those are the four generalizations.
Now this is looking at the superior aspect of the brain. There's the back, so this is the cerebrum. There's the anterior view. Here's your longitudinal fissure. And there's the approximate positions of the frontal lobe, parietal lobe. This is right cerebral hemisphere, left cerebral hemisphere. This one's showing you the veins intact and arteries and that one has them removed. Um, occipital lobe in the back. Lateral view. This is the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, a frontal lobe. There's your transverse fissure that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. And there's your brain stem. So a cerebrum, see how it makes up a lot of the mass, 83% of the mass. And then cerebellum and brain stem, three parts of the brain. Now, motor areas of the cerebral cortex, and also something that you may have as a question on the test, possible essay question. So the frontal lobe is where a lot of your motor output originates, controls voluntary movement. So the primary somatic cortex, that is the cortex is found in the precentral gyrus. So remember, we said the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The frontal lobe is motor, Parietal lobe is basically sensory, and this little elevation that's right in front of the central sulcus is called the precentral gyrus, and that is associated with connections to your skeletal muscles. Okay, so your movement is controlled there. Now, the premotor cortex is anterior to the precentral gyrus, and that is skilled motor operations that require some learned patterns or blueprints of motor movement, like typing and playing an instrument and that sort of thing. Broca's is motor for speech. And then the frontal eye field is within and anterior to the premotor cortex, superior to Broca's area, but all these are found in the frontal lobe. Here's a picture, and I've, I've um, colored these four motor areas in red. So primary motor cortex is here. There's your central sulcus. So red is motor. Premotor cortex in front of it. Uh, frontal eye field in front of that. And then inside, outline for that reason, that's Broca's area. So the primary motor cortex, these are large pyramidal cells of the precentral gyrus, precentral gyri. They call them pyramidal cells because they have pyramid-shaped pyramid bodies. They have very long axons. And these pyramidal cells are also called corticospinal tracts of the spinal cord. Now, myelinated axons in the central nervous system are called tracts. Myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system are simply called nerves, and we'll get to those in chapter 13. But for right now, these pyramidal tracts, corticospinal tracts, these are in the central nervous system, and they're myelinated axons. So the tracts usually indicate where they come from and where they're going to. So these come from that outside layer of the cerebrum, that gray matter that's called the cortex. So they start there, so that's why they're called cortico, and then they go to the spinal cord. So corticospinal from the cortex into the spinal cord, and these carry information that's motor in origin and carries it out through the spinal cord to spinal nerves that are going to connect to skeletal muscles. So that's what their job is, motor output. So this area allows conscious control of precise skilled or uh, skilled skeletal muscle movements. And there's a mapping that's done over this part of the cortex. And there's this little guy called the homunculus. And the homunculus is an upside down caricature that represents the contralateral motor innervation of body regions. So let me show you what I mean. So here's the little homunculus. And he's not in proportion. The size of the body parts reflect the, the amount of the cortex region that's devoted to that particular area of the body. So here's motor in red, and there's sensory in blue. Okay, so remember, sensory input comes in by way of the postcentral gyrus. So sensory input is in the parietal, nerve, parietal region of the brain, and that's your postcentral gyrus. Motor output, 
precentral gyrus, okay, so that's in the frontal lobe. So you can see that you have a lot of fine motor ability in the face, facial expression, speaking, moving the tongue, making sounds. So that's a lot more of the cortex is devoted to that region, moving those muscles, fingers, thumb, very nimble hands. You get a lot of delicate movement in the hands. So a lot more of the cortex is devoted to that region. When it comes to areas of the body, the movements are, are a lot less precise and so less and less of the cortex is devoted is devoted to that particular type of motor output so this is motor output sensory when you think about sensory where would you have the most feeling lips face fingers are very sensitive teeth tongue you feel pain or you have feelings in your abdominal organs so you can have sensations there um, but when you get to other areas of the body, the receptor fields are more spread out and you don't feel as sensitive or feel as precise feelings as you do with your hands and your face. That's why, you know, when people reading Braille, they have more uh, denser receptor field in their fingertips and they can uh, pick up more detail that way. So this is sensory. This is motor. So other motor areas. Free motor cortex, this is where you plan movements. It's a staging area for skilled motor activities. So wherever you learn a pattern, repetitive movement, pattern motor skills, um, playing an instrument, typing, any type of, of blueprint that's formed for precise motor activities, then that would be stored there. So like if you do any type of crocheting or anything like that, um, after you practice for a while, you get better at it, and that information is stored there. <clears throat> Broca's area is a motor for speech, and your frontal eye field, um, external eye movements, very important in reading. So people that have damage to this particular area may not be able to follow lines of type on a page. People that have damage here may not be able to make certain sounds or put together um, the right muscle movements to create a certain or say a certain word. Now we go to sensory. So sensory is spread out over large areas of the brain. We talked about the um, parietal region of the brain being involved with your primary somatosensory cortex. That's general senses, inf information that comes in through the skin. Okay, so if you feel something, you can tell whether it's you're feeling it with your fingers, your toes, your face. Okay, it can determine where it's coming from. And we just saw that the little homunculus is the uh, mapping out over that cortex. Now your primary visual cortex, that's in the occipital lobe and your auditory co cortex is in the temporal lobe. Vestibular is um, equilibrium and that's in the insula. So there is a lobe that's inside that is surrounded by the other lobes of the brain, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, the occipital. And for that reason, I like to say it's insulated. And that's where the word insula is very similar and, and um, it makes sense. It kind of connects together for me. The primary olfactory cortex, smell, temporal lobe, gustatory taste, insula, and visceral sensory area, insula. So you can see how the other lobes are involved with sensory areas. Now there are sensory areas that are what we call association areas where you can put together information um, to be able to identify and interpret sensory input. So there is this association area like where you can feel things and tell what they are. Like if I put my hand in my pocket and I had a paper clip and a quarter and a nickel in there, I could say, oh yeah, that's a paper clip and yep, that, that's a quarter. And you can tell by just feeling something, you can associate it, the shape with what it actually is. Now, visual association areas. So you can look at something and appreciate it, or you can um, see something and maybe not appreciate it, okay? But, or be familiar with something, or be familiar with somebody's face, okay? All this is association. Associate, associating objects with memory and like and dislike. Auditory, the same thing. You can remember people by the sound of their voice, certain music you like and certain music you don't like. 
Um, another sound memory. Sometimes songs can make people cry if it connects to a certain memory. So all this um, is integrative. So there's another look at that sensory, sensory area and the mapping out of the little homunculus and um, showing you where different parts of the body, where those receptions are picked up. Prefrontal cortex is the most complex area of the brain. That's in the very, very front of the frontal lobe, like right above your eyes. This is where your personality is. So your intellect, your complex learning abilities, recall, personality, working memory to make abstract ideas, where you judgment seat, reasoning, persistence, planning, um, all that stuff is incorporated there. That, that, that is the part of the brain that really defines who you are as a person. So another look at the brain, motor areas here, remember, and your precentral gyrus is your primary motor cortex that connects the skeletal muscles, central sulcus, behind it, parietal lobe. And this area right here is your postcentral gyrus, for sensory input and showing you some of the other areas, the gustatory area, visual cortex, auditory areas and association areas. So you can look at this picture and, and you know, get a, get a visual in your mind of where things are, um, but just kind of as a review. Now, the effects of cerebral lesions. If you have a stroke and part of the brain is destroyed and these neurons die, they're not replaced. And wherever you have these type of lesions could give you an idea of what type of effects that person's going to have. So parietal lobe lesions could cause something called contralateral neglect syndrome. And contralateral neglect syndrome is where a person would not recognize or understand a certain part of the body to belong to them, that they don't believe it belongs to them. Um, and you may see this. It's very bizarre. Uh, sometimes you'll see in a nursing home where somebody's carrying around their arm and they think it's a puppy or a pet or a stone because they don't think it belongs to them. I've seen this myself. Temporal lobe lesions, your identity or being able to recognize people, a lot of that comes from the superior part of the temporal lobe. And so the word agnosia or prosopagnosia refers to the inability to recognize someone. Um, so you may not be able to recognize a familiar object. You may not be able to recognize a person that you normally would. And in very, very severe cases, this is not even be able, not even being able to recognize yourself. So you can get to the point that you don't even recognize who you are. Um, you may see this uh, sometimes dealing with elderly people that have advanced stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, that you go in to see them and you say, hello, grandma, and they look at you and say they don't know who you are. Um, so this is very, very common. And I can remember visiting my father in the nursing home. He had, he had Lewy body dementia associated with Parkinson's, and I showed him a picture of himself one day, and he had no idea who that was. So it can be very, very sad um, to see this type of disability and degeneration occurring, especially if it's in a loved one. Now, frontal lobe lesions can lead to profound personality disorders because remember, we talked about the prefrontal cortex being involved in your personality. Um, and sometimes people can be very inappropriate um, and do things they wouldn't normally do under uh, if they were in their right mind. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, cerebral lateralization. And I said that there are some things that are dominant in one hemisphere versus the other. So the left hemisphere is specialized for speech and writing, science and math, analytical reasoning, linear thinking, right hemisphere, imagination and insight, holistic and integrative, musical and artistic ability, patterns and spatial relationships. Um, so they also say that people that are left hemisphere dominant are, tend to be right-handed. And people that are right hemisphere dominant tend to be left-handed. 
So, um, not, but that doesn't mean that we're strictly one hemisphere or the other because we use the entire brain, but it may mean that you are better able or better suited to perform um, different types of activities based on uh, which hemisphere is actually better developed. Now, moving away from the cerebral hemispheres and talking about the connections within them. These, these are the myelinated axons that project from the cerebral hemisphere and um, connect parts of the hemisphere to each other or project downward. Now, the first one I want to talk about are the projection fibers. These are the ones that are in purple and they actually radiate from the cerebral cortex and go down through the white matter down to the brainstem. And you see they cross over. That word for crossing over is called decussation. Now, if you remember what we just talked about, we said these, de these descending pathways have a name. They're called pyramidal cells. And the pyramidal cells are also called corticospinal tracts. They go from the cortex down through the brain and they go to the spinal cord. And see what they're doing? The spinal cord's down here. So they cross over. So if this is the left side of the brain, and actually according to this picture, it's actually the right side of the brain. If this is the right side of the brain, this is going to be connecting to muscles in the left side of the body. Because remember, contralateral, so they cross over. And where do they cross over? Medulla oblongata of the brainstem is where decussation occurs. Okay, very important to remember. So those are projection fibers. There are also commissural fibers, and commissural fibers are in green. So this connects the two hemispheres to each other. Remember, we mentioned the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum are myelinated axons, white matter, that connect the two hemispheres to each other. Okay, so those are called commissural. Commissural, they cross over from one side to the other. The last type of fiber, is within the hemispheres itself and these are association fibers so where you have those little wrinkles and you have those the gyri and the sulci where the sulci are there's really not a connection between adjacent parts so these little fibers go in between the sulci and they connect parts that are close to each other but may be separated okay so those are association fibers so those are your types of white fiber tracks that you will find connecting parts of the hemispheres or the hemispheres or projecting the information downward to lower body regions. Okay, so basal nuclei. Now basal nuclei is actually gray matter, small areas of gray matter within the white matter of the brain. So we said here's gray matter outside, right? That's the cerebral cortex. White matter here, that lighter tan, that's the white matter of the cerebral cortex. And then in here where you see these color regions, this right here, this red, these are parts of the basal nuclei. Now the basal nuclei, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with because it really does get involved, but it is really important in coordinating motor movements because you see people that have Parkinson's tend to have a deterioration in this area of the brain and the loss of functioning is what makes it very difficult for them to have patterns of movement that um, are accomplished very smoothly. So these are the parts though. You have the caudate nucleus, the putnam, the globus pallidus, pallidus um, but those are the parts. And I'll just, there's the connection with basal nuclei from the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, the brainstem, all this coordinates through this gray matter in the middle of the cerebrum. And some of the things that the basal nuclei coordinate are voluntary movements, procedures, behaviors, habit, habits, the reward center, emotions. So there's a lot involved with the basal nuclei and what they connect to. Now the diencephalon is in the very middle of the brain. It actually radiates down through from the cerebrum and connects the cerebrum to the brainstem. So the diencephalon is the connection between the cerebrum and the brainstem. That's important. And it has three parts. The thalamus is the switching and relay station, which will 
come in handy. We can see that in a little bit. I'm going to make this connection for you as we uh, continue our discussion and we get into chapter 13. You'll see how this ties in. Uh, hypothalamus, very important, a lot of functions, but for right now, remember that it regulates body temperature, uh, the hunger and thirst center, sleep regulates emotions, so the hypothalamus, uh, very, very important. And epithalamus, um, that's the back part of the diencephalon. It contains this gland that's called the pineal gland that secretes melatonin, and melatonin regulates day-night sleep cycles. So all those thalamuses are parts of the diencephalon. Um, there's uh, the, a cross-section, mid-sagittal section of the brain. Just some things I wanted to point out here. There's the hemisphere, okay? So this is the cerebral hemisphere. Here is that corpus callosum I was telling you about, um, those white matter that connects the two hemispheres underneath. And then here are the three parts of the thalamus. Um, there's the, I mean, the um, diencephalon. There's the thalamus. There's the hypothalamus. So the thalamus is right here. It looks like an egg. And then the hypothalamus is right below it. And I did not colorize the, the epithalamus, but that's back here. And there's your pineal gland, that little tiny uh, purple thing. And that's what produces the melatonin. So see how the diencephalon connects the cerebrum to the brainstem in green? It's right in the middle. So the brainstem has three parts. The midbrain contains a region that's called the corpora quadrigemini. Now the corpora quadrigemini what that does is that reacts to visual and auditory reflexes that you're going to turn your head to visual cues or auditory cues. For example, visual would be tracking a moving object. And we don't usually track things. Animals will look and turn their head at everything they see. They're right tuned into it. We only track something. I mean, if it's me, it has to be good looking. Okay, then I might track it. Auditory is turning your head to sounds. Now, animals will turn their head to every sound that they hear. We're not so much tuned into that, but if something was really loud, like if I threw a glass across the room and it shattered or something, or if I kicked somebody, everybody would be turning their head to see what in the heck was going on. So animals have a much larger corpora quadrigemini because they are more tuned into visual and auditory cues. Humans, over the course of time, we kind of tune out a lot and we really don't pay attention to visual auditory cues unless they're really, really important or they're loud enough for us to really, un to really pay attention to. Substantia nigra regulates the basal nuclei. And this is really important in Parkinson's because the substantia nigra produces dopamine. And people that have Parkinson's are very deficient in dopamine. And a lot of your deterioration in Parkinson's comes in this region. So as this region deteriorates and you produce less and less dopamine to stimulate the basal ganglia, then coordinated motor movement is, it deteriorates over time. Now this paraaqueductal gray matter surrounds the cerebral aqueduct. Remember, the cerebral aqueduct is that opening that connects the third and fourth ventricles. So cerebral spinal fluid flows through there. And there are neurons surrounding that, op that little canal. And this is where pain reception takes place. So a lot of pain gets, um, a lot of pain receptions radiate through this particular region of the brainstem. The pons has respiratory control centers, and we'll speak about those in more detail in AMP2. And the medulla, which is the terminal part, has a lot of functions, and I would really, really make sure that you know what the functions of the medulla are. Now, the first one we talked about earlier, this is where the pathways cross over. So the right brain passes inflama information to the left side of the body to coordinate those muscles, and so we, that's the contralateral effect we mentioned earlier. So decussation of those pyramidal tracts occurs there, and these functions are really important too. So your cardiovascular centers, all right? So heart rate, um, blood pressure, that's vasomotor, okay? Um, controlling the diameter of blood vessels. So if there's constriction, it raises blood pressure. If they're dilated, it lowers blood pressure. 
and your respiratory centers there's two more centers in this part of the brain so there's actually two two respiratory centers here two down here so there's four like I said we'll talk about that next semester so you just want to remember all the functions associated with the medulla oblongata and the three portions of the brain stem midbrain pons medulla and that's the inferior view of the brain showing you the approximate location of the uh, midbrain the pons and the medulla oblongata now the cerebellum is important because it's like the autopilot so any intentions that come from the cerebrum remember the cerebrum is where the intention comes from for movement through way of the cortical spinal tracts to be able to carry out particular movements of your skeletal muscle this is where full body blueprint of motion is actually stored so if you learn to play a sport and you play basketball or you dance you take Zumba or aerobics classes this is where full body movement and activities are stored so the cerebellum receives the impulses from the cerebral cortex of the intent to initiate voluntary muscle contraction so the intents there but you want it to be coordinated so there are signals that come from proprioceptors and these are in the muscles themselves okay that respond to degrees of stretch within those muscles and from what you see that's going on around you and equilibrium pathways that continuously inform the cerebellum of the body's position and momentum so what you see what your brain is interpreting for balance and what's going on inside the muscles the degree of stretch all that information is processed pulled, put together and the cerebellum can carry out activities based on where you are in space so if you're standing straight up tall and you're walking across the room it's a totally different reaction than if all of a sudden you tripped and you started to fall and you lost your balance it would accelerate the activity of other muscle groups or certain muscles to catch the fall and prevent you from falling so it's all based on all this different input visual equilibrium proprioception so the cerebellar cortex calculates the best way to smoothly coordinate the muscle contraction and stores a blueprint of coordinated movements sent to the cere this cerebral motor cortex and brainstem nuclei so very important so this is the cerebellum balance and equilibrium there is the cerebellum you can see the gray matters on the outside and the white matter that's on the inside it kind of looks like a tree so they call this the arbor vitae which means tree of life now another thing about the cerebellum is remember there is the transverse fissure that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum but the information that comes from here has to go to here to be coordinated so what actually connects the two well the connection comes from here the connection comes by way of these cerebellar peduncles the peduncles are little feet that connect the cerebellum to the brain stem and that in turn becomes your relay between the cerebrum and the cerebellum so the superior one connects the cerebellum to the midbrain the middle one connects the cerebellum to the pons and the inferior one connects the cerebellum to the medulla oblongata now we go to the limbic system now the limbic system is kind of your primitive brain and there's three parts you have the cingulate gyrus which is right here okay and then you have the amygdala or amygdaloid amygdaloid body but it's usually called the amygdala and that's right down here and then the hippocampus is right here okay so these structures are kind of embedded in the middle of the brain and this is your emotional brain emotional brain This slide talks about how the limbic system is a very important relay uh, between 
the prefrontal cortex, which is where you consciously interpret what's going on around you, but you can emotionally react to those things at the same time. And this happens through the hypothalamus. So there is this relay between your emotional brain and your cognitive brain. So you react emotionally to things you consciously understand going on around you, and you're also consciously aware of the emotional richness of your life. Um, sometimes people overreact to emotions, and because of that, they wind up with psychosomatic illnesses because of the hormones released by the hypothalamus that can um, increase activity like indigestion, so incre can increase gastric secretions to cause heartburn, or um, release of hormones from the adrenal medulla, which are your catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which can increase the stress response and cause vasoconstriction um, of the blood vessels and increase blood pressure. So an overactive emotional response can cause um, a lot of physical problems as well.